Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Vlad introduce himself. But um, thanks, guys, for attending. I know it's Sunday morning. Hopefully, you're not super hungover. All yours, brother. Good morning. Uh, this is the presentation on jumping the epidermal barrier. Uh, my name is Vlad Gostomelsky. I've been doing penetration testing, uh, red team stuff, uh, breaking embedded systems and medical devices uh, professionally for about 18 years. Uh, to do research for this talk, I worked with Dr. Stan uh, Nigen. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today because he had issues with his flight. Uh, something about uh, delays at the airport and uh, somebody taking a flight for a joyride. Uh, <laughs> Uh, quick disclaimer, uh, the opinions are my own, not of my employer. Uh, there are FDA regulations about devices. Uh, the device we're going to be talking about does require a prescription. Uh, you're not supposed to just go on eBay and buy one. Uh, you're not supposed to just order one from uh, Europe and have it shipped to your house, so definitely don't do that. Uh, I'm not picking any one particular vendor. The device uh, I'm presenting on about today is actually one of the slightly more secure ones that we found. We found devices that were uh, far worse. Uh, and until somebody actually fixes them, we're uh, not going to release the findings publicly because uh, it's only fun to kill people when it's in a pen test report, not in real life. Uh, the device we're playing with is uh, a Freestyle Libre device. It's a continuous glucose monitor. Uh, so uh, for those who don't know, let's uh, quickly go over what it is and what it does. So as I mentioned, it is a control device. You can't just walk into a CVS and pick one up unless you have a prescription. Uh, the reason people use them is because it doesn't require continuous fingerprint, uh, finger pricks. Uh, it's a device that uh, is continuously attached to your skin. According to the FDA filings and the FCC filings, the sensor is supposed to work for 14 days. Uh, for some reason, the sensors I've been given uh, only work for seven to 10 days. Uh, the way that the sensor communicates with the reader uh, is using an RFID protocol. Uh, it's a passive sensor uh, in 13.56 megahertz range. Uh, it's supposed to be readable to three meters. Uh, from what I've been able to see, it's actually more like maybe one meter. Uh, it's a fully passive device, meaning unless you have the reader near the sensor, the sensor will not broadcast information. You essentially have to ping the sensor. Uh, it's not like your EasyPass, which is an active uh, transmitter. It's more like the tags that you see in the store or the kind of tags that your employer typically gives you to badge into a building, which are uh, more, most typically passive sensors. Uh, this is roughly how the ecosystem is supposed to work. Uh, there's three typical use cases. Uh, the one that really got me interested in doing this research is the continuous glucose monitor attached to your skin uh, paired with a pump that actually uh, injects insulin as needed uh, based on the way that uh, you and your doctor configured it. Uh, the second use case is just using the reader and being able to use the reader uh, to inject insulin to yourself or to take other action uh, based on the numbers. Uh, and the third one is if you have a cell phone that actually can do RFID reads, is you can actually hold up your cell phone up to the reader, uh, get the reading, and then it can then push the information to your watch or push to Apple Health or whatever other uh, management software you use for your readings. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, when we selected this device for doing the presentation, uh, it's one of the less horrible ones that we've seen. Uh, the way the ecosystem works is that this reader actually activates the sensor. You're not continuously broadcasting, unlike some of the other sensors we've seen in the market. Uh, if you were to take a sensor and come up to me, uh, your reader would not be able to read my sensor because it has uh, been paired. Uh, that's completely artificial. I use an RFID protocol, so you can actually uh, do a wideband scan and read any kind of RFID device. So the logic in this, in this reader is what prevents it from reading somebody else's sensor. Uh, once you activate uh, the reader that's attached to you, uh, you can actually configure it to be readable by any reader or by the phone. But uh, when you first place a sensor in your skin, it is in a in non-active state uh, and it cannot be read by, uh, uh, by a phone. It has to be activated by one reader and by default that's the reader that's paired to it. So after that, this reader would only be looking for that particular card ID. Uh, some of the things we didn't like about this is that the sensors are officially time banked. Uh, as I mentioned, I was getting about uh, 10 days worth of readings from my sensor. Uh, upon opening up the sensor and examining the battery, 
uh, the battery still had sufficient charge in it to operate quite a bit longer. Uh, we're speculating that this may have something to do with the uh, sensor calibration or sensor corrosion since there is a needle that pierces, you know, pierces your skin. Uh, the needle is actually uh, slightly longer than I was expecting when I go into this research. Um, not found the needles. Uh, the battery life, as I mentioned, uh, is pretty impressive, but uh, it's artificially time banked uh, either to make you buy a new sensor. By the way, uh, each of these sensors that lasts only 10 days uh, is 100 bucks. Uh, and uh, it's set up to require authorization. Uh, and, uh, keep in mind, I said authorization, not authentication. Uh, so uh, it's uh, actually quite easy to bypass and spoof. Uh, so this is what the two major components look like. Uh, this is the reader, uh, and this is what a packaged up sterile sensor is before we apply it. I'm hoping not to fly with it with uh, TSA uh, trying to pull it off because sometimes they're not too familiar with uh, this hardware. Uh, so, as I mentioned, there's no actual authentication. Uh, when this reader is placed on your skin, it will accept activation from any reader. Uh, the reader, it looks for a particular uh, serial range of sensors. So if you have an American reader and you buy a sensor from Europe, uh, it actually will not activate. They're trying to force you to pay uh, uh, US prices for these, um, for these sensors, which we thought was pretty interesting. Uh, looking at this device, uh, you'll notice that there is a USB port. Uh, this, uh, the device does support USB mass storage, but it's not activated by default. You actually have to mess with the firmware to activate mass storage, and then you can uh, pull off of an entire CSV file of your readings from this device. Uh, you can also push firmware updates over USB. Uh, I have not been able to get my hands on an official uh, firmware. Uh, I've seen some on the forums, but they were not for US readers. So if anybody does have a copy, uh, I would love uh, to get my hands on it. Uh, the device is also running USB debug interface, uh, so it's easy to fuzz and make the device crash. Uh, it's also possible to introduce false readings uh, into the device, which gets us into data integrity. Uh, if you were to use a radio, uh, a standard RFID reader, uh, you could read a tag, uh, modify the data, and uh, change the glucose reading and change the timestamp. You can write it back to the reader. Uh, there's no integrity check. Uh, it's also highly susceptible to replay attacks. For example, I can take a reading. Uh, so since this device doesn't keep a timestamp, uh, I can keep playing back the same reading, and the device will happily log it which uh, is pretty bad if you're relying on it for uh, making medical decisions or treatment decisions. Uh, what we found is a lot of times the patients will actually call their doctor to discuss the, the readings uh, before taking action uh, if they're out of norm. Uh, so the doctors also rely on this data. They don't make somebody come into the hospital they, uh, uh, from speaking to doctors. Uh, sometimes they'll make a patient actually do a finger, pr uh, a finger prick uh, reading uh, as opposed to just relying on uh, CGM. Uh, there is an add-on product that works with the sensor. Uh, it provides a Bluetooth bridge, uh, so, which means that even if your phone doesn't have an RFID interface, you essentially wear a band over your sensor and it'll continuously transmit uh, your CGM data. Uh, there's some really fun Bluetooth attacks, which means you can actually force a legitimate cell phone to unpair from the Bluetooth bridge and you can then pair with that sensor. Uh, since it's not made by the same manufacturer as this glucose monitor, uh, we didn't focus on it too much, but uh, you can read up on it. And uh, so the Bluetooth bridge is actually not a prescription device. Uh, you could buy it and uh, play with it uh, because the FDA regulated device is the sensor and the reader, uh, not the Bluetooth bridge. Uh, there's also a long-range RF bridge. Uh, this is uh, mostly designed for institutional situations where somebody may be in a hospital and they're trying to collect large amounts of data all at the same time. Uh, we were able to find one on eBay that was decommissioned by a hospital, uh, and we were playing with it using uh, HackRF. Uh, we ended up writing a, a small little program for the portal pack, so you could actually just walk around with the HackRF and the add-on uh, and continuously pull the data from uh, people around you wearing the CGMs. So this is what the device actually looks like cracked open. 
Uh, this is the part that goes up against the skin. Uh, and the needle module is right there. Uh, it's been removed, but there's a very long needle that would come out here uh, and a little metallic seal. Uh, there's the battery pack uh, and the sensor. Uh, the wire traces they see going around the perimeter is the actual RFID antenna. This is what it looks like. As I mentioned, the needle's uh, a little longer than I was expecting uh, before opening up for the first time. Uh, this is the clear. Uh, the clear cover, and this is the part that we'll be facing outside when the sensor is deployed. Uh, quickly before we go any further, uh, you'll notice the tamper detection, tamper protection uh, on this device. Uh, namely, there is none. Essentially, if uh, you get your hands on the sensor, uh, you could open it up, you could modify it, you could reseal it. Uh, there's no way to know the sensor has been tampered with. The packaging in itself is simply a sterile packaging. It doesn't really have any tamper detection, tamper protection systems. Uh, fairly trivial to get this open, modified, and reseal it, uh, so you have no idea that it was opened. Uh, this is a shot of the actual reader opened up. Uh, again, uh, no protective seals on the outside. Uh, sorry, no tamper evidence seals on the outside. Uh, no tamper detection, no tamper protection inside. After the device is cracked open, you can easily modify it, uh, reclose it, and it'll continue to operate uh, without any issues. So after realizing that it has absolutely uh, no protection uh, for reads. It's a completely passive device. I had a really cool idea. What, how much data could I harvest about people around me who actually do our CGMs? Uh, since it's using a simple RFID, 13.56 megahertz. So I was thinking, how cool would it be to actually build some kind of a doorway sensor, something that you could place at kill zone, so as people walk through, you could uh, uh, force a reading from their sensors. Uh, obviously, there's a number of solutions for them. Uh, this particular solution is actually at a school uh, for attendance, so somebody could read uh, student IDs. I was hoping to get something a little bit uh, less intrusive looking, something that would, uh, would be essentially almost invisible and not make people ask questions. Uh, you'll notice there's two re readers in the doorway. That's the kind of model I was going for. Uh, the mock-up was a little rough, but I think I still nailed it. Uh, so, uh, cheap Chinese RFID card reader, uh, nice large antenna, Raspberry Pi, battery pack, uh, and uh, the seven inch LCD for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, privacy risks, as I mentioned, it's a passive sensor, no authentication, simple authorization is essentially based on good faith. So uh, you could read it with uh, any commercial reader. Uh, so if you were uh, essentially getting into medical privacy risks, somebody could walk around and continuously pull your reader and gather the same medical data that is only really meant for you and your doctor. So you're getting into HIPAA violation issues. Uh, data integrity, uh, fairly trivial to read the data and uh, if you have a device that's transmitting at more power, then you're now broadcasting the new, uh, uh, the new glucose readings. Uh, fairly trivial to get more power. Uh, so this sensor, when activated uh, uh, by this device, uh, uses 0.3 watts, which is pretty much nothing. Uh, it's uh, very feasible to get your hands on the transmitters that will push at one or two watts uh, and 13.56 megahertz. Uh, the best uh, reader that I found to actually emulate it is this one. Uh, you have an entry price of under $50 uh, to play with this. Uh, there are cheaper readers. Uh, this is in the $12 range, but the range is very limited. Uh, you're getting three to six centimeters range, which basically means you're essentially at contact distance. Uh, we did uh, disclose some of the findings. Uh, if you're working with the manufacturers who actually fared worse than this device first, uh, uh, simply because of how easy it was to mess with the data. Any questions? Yes. 
Uh, how much trouble did you have uh, working with this equipment to take a lot of debugging and here or uh, so, so the question was uh, if I had any trouble working with the equipment or uh, debugging. Uh, it was actually fairly straightforward because it's a consumer medical device. It's meant to be used by kids. It's meant to be used by people with no IT experience or medical experience. Uh, the hardest part was actually uh, getting the sensor onto you and getting it to stick. Uh, the actual RF uh, part was very straightforward. Because as I mentioned, it's just RF, uh, pro, RFID protocol, 13.56 megahertz. There's already tons of tools uh, uh, to work with it uh, to parse up the data and to transmit. Yes? Have you thought about any solutions to some of the problems you've listed in terms of like, privacy violations and whatnot? Uh, so my thoughts on that is uh, not using the RFID protocol. Uh, they use it primarily for power consumption. It's because they're using a passive protocol. The reader pulls it uh, and provides the actual power. Uh, there are ways to do it more securely. Uh, but uh, it would make uh, the sensor a lot bulkier than it currently is and heavier. Uh, so uh, they could uh, license a different frequency, for example. Uh, and not use 13.56 megahertz. That would force an attacker to uh, retool, use different antennas, perhaps change the code a little bit. But it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be possible to use the tools already out there, essentially prepackaged for an attacker. Yes? Have you been able to share this risk with the vendor um, to see if they can improve their security there? Uh, we have not uh, spoken with this particular vendor. Uh, we don't have, very, have a really good point of contact for them. Uh, we've contacted the other manufacturers that we've uh, done uh, used for initial research that we've done. So, do you, did you ever have the chance to maybe recommend that, um, I guess, update or you know, something that they can do to? Uh, so the vulnerabilities with 13.56 megahertz and RFID are widely documented. Uh, as far as the vulnerabilities we found with the replay attack and USB, uh, that uh, we feel that's really up to their R&D department and their own internal security department. Uh, it feels like they haven't really done basic security testing on their own. There's a new law in Europe, the General Data Protection Regulation. These things are sold in Europe, right? They are sold in Europe and Eastern Europe, yes, so as well as the United States. What do you think of the possibility that if there was an actual privacy breach, someone could file a GDPR complaint and the company could be fined 4% of their annual income? Uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, you could essentially do that by forcing an event. As I mentioned, if you were to place a reader on there and do something similar to Wall of Sheep and just transmit people's CGM data on the wall, uh, you'd essentially force the event. Yeah, you, you need to have it happen kind of more in the wild. You know, if somebody else did it, like you wouldn't want to be, if you were going to file a complaint, you wouldn't want to be part of the cause. <laughs> yeah. Essentially, you need somebody to set up a sensor and a projector right there in, a, in an airport and broadcast on the wall, and there you go. Okay, well, well, I predict someone will do this within the next month or so. Maybe not on this device, right? It might happen in the next 24 hours as everyone's flying home. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, I'm available offline if you don't want to ask any uh, other questions uh, publicly. Uh, thank you very much for coming.